Welcome to New Thinking for a New World, a Tilburg Foundation podcast. I am Alan Stoga, your host. Each week, I bring you conversations with people who think differently about the great issues that are shaping our world. Geopolitics, disruptive tech, mass migration, the changing climate, culture wars, all of it is grist for our mill. I hope you enjoy listening. I also hope you will let me know what you think and that you join the conversation at telbergfoundation.org. And now for today's episode of New Thinking for a New World. Welcome to this special episode of New Thinking for a New World. I'm your host, Alan Stoga of the Telberg Foundation. Shahidul Alam is a world-class Bangladeshi photographer, and perhaps more importantly, a world-class human rights advocate. Needless to say, that doesn't make him very popular with the powers that be in Dhaka, where the government constantly threatens him with imprisonment, or to be precise, re-imprisonment. Shahadul is also part of the Telberg Foundation's Global Leadership Network. In that capacity, he recently delivered a short provocation to a meeting of the network, reflecting on the realities of democracy and the challenges of freedom. This is not the usual new thinking for a new world conversation, but I think you will find it stimulating and, well, provocative. Enjoy. Just last week, I put up a show at the United Nations on freedom of expression and opinion. And one of the things we did was to build a 16 meter scroll of the 1,602 journalists who've been killed in the last 30 years. Sadly, after we built that, uh, designed and printed that scroll, several others have been killed, including one journalist in Bangladesh who was beaten to death in broadcast in daylight. Now, that's the reality we live in. Have that scroll, and as, as people walk through, they relate to individuals in there. I have friends on that list. Pretty much everyone who walked through that space knew someone or was associated in some way with people in that list. There's a Freedom of Information Index. Uh, Bangladesh comes 163 on that list, pretty low down. There are countries which are very high up. Scandinavian countries, one, two, three. Uh, Netherlands, six. Canada, 12 or 15, I'm not sure. Uh, Very high up, doing very well. My question is somewhat different in the sense that What are these people doing with their freedoms? Yeah, sure, you're one, two, three, all that sort of thing. What's the point of having a freedom if you've done nothing with it? In a country like mine where, yeah, I've been tortured and spent time in jail. I'm still on bail. I I face 14 years in prison if convicted. I I face, uh, you know, a court hearing every month over the last five years and will continue. I'm still here. I'm still at the United Nations, still wherever I am, saying what I do. But I see people in those free countries perfectly comfortable with their nations doing what they do. Uh, I, of course, we talked about Ukraine. We talked about the invasion. And I, of course, am completely in solidarity with the people being traumatized and invaded. But these same countries which are so, so aggravated by what's happening in Ukraine have been perfectly happy to see Palestinians uh, occupied and uh, treated the way they have been for nearly 50 years. And I, I have a problem uh, with that duality. Dictators do what they do because they get away with it. Liberal democracies do what they do because we stay silent in the face of those things. Why have we who are so angry about what happens to Uyghurs, what happens to Ukrainians, suddenly so comfortable allowing Bush and Blair to get away with war crimes? Why are we perfectly at ease to see how different borders of Poland treat migrants very differently because They come from different places. And I have a serious problem with that issue. But I'll go back um, to what I do. I mean, okay, I live and work in Bangladesh. And certainly 
I chose to become a storyteller because I'm very aware that the stories about countries like mine, which I call majority world countries, I don't like being known as third world or developing world or least developed country, you know. Uh, I didn't choose that definition for myself. But I do have a serious problem when uh, I recognize that the G8 countries, which represent less than 13% of the world's population, makes decisions for, my, for the farmer in my field who made no choice in determining them to be our representatives. Thanks for listening so far. I hope you're enjoying the conversation as much as I have. If you haven't already, please subscribe on the platform of your choice and rate us on Apple Podcast. Now back to today's discussion, sponsored by the Stavros Niarchus Foundation, SNF. And I look at the power situation. I mean, I'm a photographer, so I'm sometimes there in uh, taking pictures of people. And I, I will say, while I have passionately tried to create a platform for local storytellers. I don't have a problem with white Western photographers coming over, uh, having diarrhea for the first two days, taking pictures on the third in a country like mine. But uh, I think my own position needs to be challenged and it's perfectly valid. What I do have a serious problem with is them having an exclusive monopoly on my story. And I want to change that process. And in doing so, one of the things we need to look at are the power structures that exist. So if I'm in a village taking a photograph of a farmer in a field, the person who's probably the most knowledgeable about this situation is a farmer. I, being close through induction, perhaps know a little bit. The person who's the least knowledgeable about that process is a picture editor in New York Times. But in that process, the person who's the most powerful and the one who decides is the picture editor in the New York Times and the person who's the least powerful and has no say in how that story is told is the farmer in the field. And we need somehow to try and change that process. And as we talk about a whole lot of these things, I mean, we, we need also to question the very basis of development. Uh, because you know, we, we, have, we look at systems, we look at what propagates them. Uh, there's a very famous war photographer, Robert Kappa, um, and he was asked what it is that you would want for. What, what do you hope for? What do you wish for? And he said, being redundant. As a war photographer, what he wants is to be out of a job. But we look, let's look at our systems. And in development, our job is to eradicate poverty, supposedly. But through eradicating poverty, I'm actually making myself out, getting myself out of a job. So the, there is a built-in process of self-perpetuation which ensures that that inequality exists, that we never actually disturb. Okay, we can say all the right things, whatever, but we ensure the status quo because my living depends on it. We talk about peace. There is one country that provides 52% of the world's arms. It is in its business interest to ensure that we never have peace. War is its primary business proposition. And you look at the United Nations, you look at the Security Council. All the members of the Security Council are the worst are the biggest manufacturers of weapons. And I, I, I remember talking about this in Bonn. There was the German Secretary of State talking, waxing lyrical about how they'd gone to Bangladesh and how they were doing all these things for peace. And I said, look, you know, if you have the Security Council trying to ensure peace, it's like giving your child to a pedophile for safety. But that's, that's the truth. You have nations who have an active interest in propagating war who we've entrusted world peace with. I think at one point, we need to ask very tough questions of ourselves, how we in, and I say we, because this is a global community and we have people from all across the world, we as individuals in our own systems, what have we done to ensure 
that the powerful elite in our own countries cannot get away with the uh, with what they get away with. So I'm in a country where we have uh, the rapid action battalion. It's a paramilitary force that kills people at a regular interval. They were set up to, as in many of these things, to end corruption. Uh, but of course, we know what happens. Now, there were, on an average, there were 25 people being killed a month. And the government, of course, denied they had any involvement. It was the criminals killing each other in crossfire. They, they had nothing to do with it. Uh, the United States put a sanction on rapid action battalion. And immediately, the criminals stopped killing each other. Now, we have pretty considerate criminals who, because the Uni United States puts a sanction on Bangladesh government, they stop killing each other. Interesting. But I will go further than that. The Rapid Action Battalion has been armed by the CIA, trained by the CIA, and the MI6 and the MI5. And while these countries waxed lyrical about democracy and freedom, the reality is that none of them have any interest in democracy whatsoever and are far happier with a pliant dictator than a messy democracy because they're easier to deal with. They're better business partners. And I think while we do all the things we do until we rise up and question our own systems and point fingers at what they are doing, what they're being allowed to get away with because of our silence, we have problems. And I'd like you to get rid of that silence. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for New World. I'm Alan Stoga, podcast host, and I look forward to your joining our next conversation. Remember, tell us what you think at telbergfoundation.org.